Today's talk is titled, What Contemporary Representational <coughs> Paintings Can Tell Us to be Delivered by John Seed. John Seed, his wife Linda, and two daughters Evan and Condi moved to Cambria six years ago in search of beauty and community. His oldest daughter, Chloe, lives in Portland. John is an artist, writer, and independent curator who holds degrees, oh, you're right, who holds degrees in studio art from Stanford University and UC Berkeley. Yep, yeah. his most recent book, More Disruption, Representational Art in Flux, presents the works of 43 artists whose works tell the story of their experience in a world of disruption. John recently stepped down after serving three years at the board president of Greenspace, which is one of our son, uh, fourth Sunday recipients. And he's looking forward, he's looking forward to becoming a grandfather in April. <laughs> Please welcome John. Well, thank you for having me back. And it's just a great feeling to be here. I'm really honored to be speaking to you. And with that said, uh, Randy has done a really great job editing the presentation. He's shown me how the clicker works. So <laughs> let's move forward. Really, really brief art history lesson. I wanted to say something about the history of painting. That's a portrait from 1750 by Thomas Gainsborough. And it gives me a reminder of what painting traditionally did in so many societies, and that was to emphasize status. It was an aristocratic way of recording one's life and one's ownership of property. And what a difference now where painting has the competition of smartphones, where each of us is in a way an artist who can capture any moment, formal or informal or humorous. It's changed the way we see ourselves. And that's a little bit of the context. That's the context that painting lives in now you know painting seems old painting seems stodgy sometimes but i look at contemporary art as being very very alive and very vivid and i've chosen today's presentation you know to tell you what i am seeing in painting and of course my background is that for more than 30 years i taught both painting and art history at a community college so as my daughters will tell you the way I'm interested in painting, it's the way some of you are interested in sports or music or wine or travel. It's an obsession. And that's what I bring to you. Some of the things I wanted to say about painting is just to remember that each painting is a decision. An artist has said, this is worth my time. This is worth painting. This is worth showing to you. I like to remind people that painting is slow, whereas photography is fast. So there's a great deal of effort and skill that goes into the paintings I'm going to be showing you today. Painting's personal. That's part of the decision I mentioned, you know, as the, uh, the first element. Painting also joins you with a long tradition. And uh, painting can take you back thousands and thousands of years. So when you pick up a brush and attempt to make a painting, you are connecting through history, across culture, across time. I think painting is a wonderful way of opening up the imagination. And I also think that painting comes through the body. It's one of the things I love about it. And something that my college art instructor used to say is he used to say there's an energy that comes from my mind through my arm into the paintbrush, and that's the only way I can explain it. And I thought that was a little bit kooky when he said it. And then I kind of, I, I lived it and decided that it, there's actually a truth about that. As I chose the works to show you today, first of all, I want to tell you something about how I hope you will see the the paintings. I'm going to offer comments. I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I see, but I'm very, very interested in what you see. I, I was interested to hear the Unitarian value of things are not written permanently or in stone. What you get from each of these paintings is very individual and very important. So I'm not an authority figure telling you what to find in these paintings, but I'm rather here having a conversation with you. And in the back over coffee when we're done, I'll hear your thoughts about these paintings. But some of the themes that, that I felt were showing up in contemporary painting, everything about connection, love, friendship, human connection, anxiety and loneliness is there, very present in recent paintings. 
You're going to see the importance of social issues and social context in contemporary painting. The environment is there. Violence is there. And then, very importantly, a great number of the paintings, I think, are primarily about being seen. An artist is showing you themselves or people they care about and letting you know this is worth your consideration and worth taking in. So that said, let's bring up some of these paintings. Uh, Bo Bartlett is a Georgia-based realist painter who, interestingly enough, first thought he was going to be a minister and then became a painter. And the quality that I admire about his paintings is the openness of the narrative. If we had an art historian here, an art historian would say, well, some older painting used to have poesia, and poesia is a poetic quality where clues are, are put out there, but things are left open. So in Bo's painting, you notice that a group of people are behind an orange cone and caution tape, and they look towards us, which must mean we're the disaster. <laughs> or, you know, something bad has happened. Is it a car crash? Is it uh, a robbery? You know, what, what's going on that they're being taped off from? And the tape is a dividing line between a young officer who must have a great deal of responsibility and the people who gaze toward whatever we don't see. And behind them is a telephone pole, which, uh, you know what, is it a telephone pole or a Christian cross? There's a play with religious symbols. <laughs> And I think when I talk to you over coffee, when we can break down some of these paintings more, there's so much to explore. The painting gets deeper and deeper the longer you look. And are there questions about race? And are there questions about our role in society and who is protecting who? I think there are. And one more Bo Bartlett painting, you know, a, a painting of a kind of a heartland American couple. And the young man holds a gun. He's been deer hunting. And you can see there's a boy in front with a stick who maybe is emulating what might be his father or his older brother, but we don't know. You know, it's not important to know. But again, we're taken into a dialogue with these characters, and Bo asks us to really, really see them and maybe judge them, maybe not judge them, but think about who they are and think about what they represent in history and culture <laughs> and what's our relationship to them. And again, it gets deeper and deeper and richer and richer the more you consider who they are. Ala Bartoshak is a Ukrainian-American, and her recent paintings have dealt with a kind of duality that she feels. She feels the relative safety and security of living in California, but she's intensely aware of the conflict in the Ukraine, where she has friends and family members and where the news about that conflict has a tremendous impact on her every day. And by layering her images, by showing herself, but in double uh, depiction, where one figure seems to be in one space and the other looks toward a world that is uh, only partly available, or in another painting where there's a self-portrait of Allah dreaming about the reality as she tries to dream it, experience it, and take it in with figures hovering at the bottom that we can't quite identify. Uh, she takes us into a dream space. She's an imaginative painter, and her imaginative fantasies and concerns and ruminations take us into a different space and personalize it. Sandow Burke has painted our worst nightmare for something that has happened. He's painted a school shooting. This is a history painting he did about the uh, painting at Stone Stoneman Douglas High School. And I haven't put titles up on these paintings, but I do want to give you the title of this painting. The title is The Triumph of Hate. And you'll see death, you know, on, on a skeleton horse, as if we're looking through a medieval painting in this contemporary painting. And there's an interesting decision here because you absolutely can scan this the way you might scan a news photo and see the paramedics and the victims and the scared students being led away in lines. You can see all the things that the news would show you. But by putting in the figure of hate, he's telling you something. He's depersonalizing what happened and asking you to consider that this is the byproduct of hate. You know, when hate spreads through a culture, what does it lead to when you step back? And I think that's what he's wanting to symbolize or talk about. Matt Bollinger is a wonderful painter who paints uh, what I would just call everyday experience. 
as a subject matter. And here we can see one man with a pickup truck is uh, getting some gas in a red can, while a woman who, uh, hard to say, but maybe she works in nursing or medical, you recognize that, that green outfit, but she also has just filled her tank. And uh, here he takes something very, very mundane, but by painting it, is it just me or does it have a hint of a sacred moment of a ritual or something important? And it certainly gets me reflecting on, well, what is the importance of our, our vehicles and transportation and uh, you know, our reliance on fossil fuels? All these things are there in the painting when you take it a little bit uh, deeper, but it's also just a beautiful painting, beautifully lit, intriguingly colored, takes us into their world, which is part of the power of, of painting. Deborah Brown made this incredibly vivid painting with almost, you know, day glow pigments and colors in New York City. And you're kind of walking along. If you, you put yourself in Deborah's shoes, here's a line of purses for sale on one of the streets as cars go the other direction. We see the vendors and the peddlers. And we also see just coming off the edge, a woman with her Louis Vuitton bag who almost seems like she belongs from another world. And so Deborah takes us into the flow of this experience. If you look up her art, she's very, very well known for her shadow paintings. There are a lot of paintings where you just see her shadow and the shadow of her dog as she walks her dog. So she kind of takes you on a journey. It's like, take a walk with me, take a stroll. And what do I see? And what do you see in the world we are inhabiting? Aaliyah Chapin was originally a hyper-realist painter. And I'm gonna show you one of her very, very real paintings in a moment. But during COVID, she had a change of mind about her art. She realized she had to do something to her painting to show the disruption and the anxiety she was feeling during COVID. It, it changed her and it had to change her art. So she has this kind of a double portrait where her body is the lower half of the painting and this expressionist, very rapidly brushed figure is the upper half. And the painting tells her and tells us, embrace both. They're both part of her. They're both part of her experience. And the blue tonality, which of course makes me think, well, Picasso's blue period, you know, that's the, the melancholy or the regal color, uh, gives it an emotional tone. That's one of Aaliyah's earlier paintings. And you might be interested to know that the people who posed for these paintings were all of her mother's friends. And it's a painting about, and again, you tell me over coffee, but, but to me, connection, vulnerability, frivolity, aging, the figure in nature. You know, that's what you can tell I did that for a living, right? Five themes in 30 seconds there. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, it's, again, this is what I keep finding when I look at paintings, and it's the thing I want to want to share with you is I think a, a way to maybe judge a painting, if you want to be an amateur art critic, is how much is there when you keep looking? And how much richer does it get over time when you talk about it with your friends or just talk about it with yourself? This painting gets richer and richer in the way it evokes vulnerability and even childhood for the figures involved. I found a lot of you know, satirical and biting paintings that I could show you and just chose a few I think, I think you get the message of Carl Dobsky's painting of people at a party in Los Angeles. Or you might as well call it Rome Burns, you know, or Los Angeles Burns. So there is, uh, you know, the luxury and the flirtation and the wealth and all of these things as uh, danger, seemingly in the form of a wildfire, consumes the uh, edges of the area around them. But uh, I, I don't know if this painting has a message other to, than to say, you can have a really great time while things are falling apart. <laughs> but there's certainly warnings. And, and I think there's a little bit of a minister in Carl Dobsky, just like there is in, in, in Bo Bartlett. It's a moralistic painting that puts together uncomfortable realities and uh, lets you untangle them. Michelle Dahl is a painter whose subject matter is her own family and sometimes her own friends. And anything you could want in the field of tenderness, the meaning of being together, the meaning of family, uh, the, the wonder of just time that's spent just enjoying each other, uh, parent and child, it's all there in Michelle's work. And she's another artist. You know, any of the artists I mentioned today, you'll find them on the internet, you can use Google and learn more about them, and you will find that this incredible tenderness 
uh, animates all of Michelle's pictures through her whole career. It's the heart of her painting, literally. Zoe Frank is a painter that I discovered in writing the book Disrupted Realism. And Disrupted Realism, which, by the way, it's on the back counter here, and it's also in the Cambria Library. Not because they bought it, because, but because I made them take a copy. <laughs> but uh, Zoe Frank is an artist who wanted to show a rich kind of narrative subject matter, but she didn't want to do it in a traditional way. And that's why I'll, I call her painting disrupted, or some of you might even call it a little bit cubist. It is a wedding and a wedding reception, and there is joy and dancing and revelry and decoration, but it's a little bit mixed up. Yeah, you have to make your way through it. And I think one of the things these paintings tell us is that in our very fast moving, distracted world filled with technology, we have to cover a lot of material in our lives every day. And I know here I am talking about the power of deep looking and looking at painting carefully. You come by my house, you find me with my smartphone scrolling, you know, just like all of us are, are scrolling with our smartphone. Anyways, I think that she brings together two traditions. She brings together narrative painting, you know, telling a beautiful and wonderful story, but also she reminds us how hard it is to look at so many things at once. There's a great deal of uh, gay and lesbian themed painting going on now in contemporary art. Lou Frattino, when I look at his artwork, I'm thinking he has a style like Picasso. It's modernist, it's, it's very, very graphic, it's very sophisticated, and his subject matter is simply connection and affection. And also, that, that thing I said in my presentation about, about just being seen. One thing you see a great deal in contemporary art is that artists are putting images from all kinds of social contexts in front of us and saying, we're just here to be seen. That's all. Just put your eyes on us and uh, you know, make us part of your visual world and think about our lives. Salomon Huerta, who paints the Hispanic community of Los Angeles, feels that way about his neighbors. He saw this neighbor making a sign in his front yard and, and snapped a picture and just said, I'm here, <laughs> right? You know, a very, very straightforward painting. And uh, maybe the opposite of Bo Bartlett, where there was so much going on that you had to consider and make your way through. This one is just a very, very simple one-to-one -one interaction. Kathy Lau is a Taiwanese-American whose paintings are about the, her family's immigrant experience. And uh, she has made a lot of paintings about her grandmother who is in Taiwan and who has been aging. And they meet over Zoom. That's, this is not one of those paintings, by the way. Uh, this Zoom conversation was someone else. But she has done a lot of paintings about what's it like to be both connected with people and disconnected from them. And that, for her, it's about immigration, but it also was about COVID. And her paintings make you kind of meditate on that idea. What's it like when people are in your life but you can't quite connect with them or technology helps you connect partially? And her paintings are gorgeous. And I think that a big part of what painting can do, it can seduce you into a world or a topic so it means more or resonates more deeply than a photo might. Larry Madrigal makes paintings of family and these remind me of Dutch 17th century paintings because they're often very humorous. They just make you giggle. Uh, here, a father in his underwear has his daughter, you know, who's covering his eyes so he can't quite see what he's doing. And the littlest kid in the family is looking out the sliding glass door through the, uh, the verticals. And it's a little bit of family chaos. And it's also, if you notice, there are bubbles being blown. <laughs> So it's a little moment of, of magic and maybe also a painting about what the hell is going on. <laughs> That's the point of view of the, of the father, you know, the, the, you know, a little bit of chaos is part of love and part of family and a part of contemplating the future as you try to protect your children. Kerry James Marshall uh, had a magnificent show at MOCA a few years ago. He is the first painter who, you know, as a color, really took on black as the color of black Americans. His figures are insistently black. And he took a whole group of tropes, of, of fixed ideas about how we see people and flipped them. And in this case, we have black figures, black family having a beautiful, beautiful, luxurious picnic on a lake. 
a red striped tablecloth and a picnic basket. The dog is there. Uh, the, pic the, the golf clubs are there. There's boating. It is almost like a kind of a Disney-esque world of fantasies of outdoor pleasure, like an impressionist painting turned up another notch, right? And he took all of this and he said, part of what uh, Black Americans want to happen in the way that they're seen is for their, their pleasures and the normalization of their pleasures to be, you know, a part of our visual culture, unlike, you know, depictions of problems and uh, difficulties. Rebecca Ness, wonderful Bay Area painter who painted this, what to me is a kind of a dichotomy. You can see that during COVID, she was doing everything she could to keep herself healthy. There's the organic milk, <laughs> the fresh vegetables, you know, but then Coors looming on the up upper corner, right? You know, and then all of that as, uh, again, it's the same theme as Kathy Lau, being connected with people, but not quite connected with people, right? I don't know if her parents are there on the Zoom or her friends. But, uh, you know, interestingly, the history of still life, the history of still life is it used to be paintings from the Last Supper. You know, it was it was a ritualistic and moralistic painting, but now it's about a personal situation. Justin Liam O'Brien, another gay artist, paints this picture of a bar. And I think the title of the painting is uh, Somebody Ask Me Out. So again, it's a painting about loneliness and connection or lack of connection. And it has a nice kind of a polarity in the fact that it's uh, at one level, a rhythmic, joyful, colorful, kind of, you know, brilliant painting. But the heart of the uh, heart of the matter is a sense of being dislocated and, uh, and, and lonely. So it has, you know, themes that work against each other. And being seen is there. Lee Price, fabulous photorealist painter who often paints herself in the bathtub uh, and in this case, painted herself surrounded by, uh, my gosh, it looks like she's been in Cambria with Lynn's pies almost, right? But <laughs> indulgences. So it's a painting about pleasure, but at the same time, maybe, a, a, you know, a, a picture about uh, being sated with pleasure and also a painting about loneliness. Because what are, what are the foods there? What are they compensating for? What do they, what do they make up for? And, uh, you know, what's going on in her mind as she lies, you know, in the middle? Of all of these. Alexis Rockman has devoted his paintings to the environment and uh, particularly to paintings, whole suites of animals. He's done, you know, Abaddon style paintings of animals, but updated them for ecological concerns. And here he did something that, that used to happen in medieval paintings. Medieval paintings used to give you a cross section of the world where you'd have heaven and hell and you could kind of see between both things. And here above the water, we have freighters and uh, a floating dead gull beneath the water. We have a crashed airplane. We have all kinds of you know, green odd pollution. We have uh, jellies you know, circling around the edge as cormorants dive. It's a weird, disturbing painting. And it's meant to be a weird, disturbing painting that uh, also, when you look at the far edge, evokes history with the image of the, uh, you know, the clipper ship the ship from further back. It's as if we're, you know, being told, if you sail through history, you know, this is what you're gonna find. Amy Sherald, um, you probably know her because she did Michelle Obama's uh, portrait. Uh, I think she paints the joy of life. She's been through a very, very serious heart co uh, condition when she was a younger woman. And I think coming through that and, and blossoming as a painter, there's a great deal of joy in her work. So the theme would be friendship, you know, black experience being seen and also just formally her paintings are very very simple you can see how she reduced the color to uh, the background color to just one tone to show off the patterns of the bathing suits and uh, you know she gives you this very very direct experience of these you know two young beautiful women john sansini paints day laborers in los angeles and john wants you to know he pays them well he pays them for posing the same amount they'd be paid if they were digging in, our, in your yard. And you can see one of his paintings at the Autry Museum in Los Angeles, if you'd like to see them. They're very honest workmanlike paintings, you know, which is well suited for a man that paints uh, laborers. Jansen Stegner scares me a little bit <laughs> because his athletes, uh, for example, this woman, you know, in her, her Texas hoodie here at, at breakfast, 
he distorts the figure. There's a little bit of caricature and he makes his figures a little bit too athletic and a little bit too well fed, like an experiment that's gone slightly wrong. And so here, you know, more pancakes than we really need, more, uh, more watermelon, infinite cantaloupe, two fried eggs. You know, he, I think there's an affection for this figure, but also a little bit of uh, pointed humor about who she is. Lu Zaldong is a fabulous Chinese-based uh, plein air painter, outdoor painter, who came to the United States and worked in New Mexico, I think. And here, it really fascinated him that an immigrant family had produced so many uh, law officers, the seated man's a sheriff, and immigration officers. And he said, pose outside for me. So he had them bring their gear and the sheriff's horse and all of that to an outdoor picnic and kind of showed their pride in being Americans and, uh, you know, made us think about their relationship to the culture uh, that they are so important in. And finally, I'm going to close with Jason Bard Yermoski. He has been painting his grandparents now, I think, for more than 10 years. And he, he paints his grandparents with, here's a mixture for you, affection, respect, and humor because he paints them as superheroes. And he will tell you, if you get in touch with him, that's who he thinks his grandparents are. He thinks his grandparents are basically superhumans and their love for each other, their affection for their lives and their willingness to be painted by their grandson in this way <laughs> says a lot about their family uh, relationships and uh, connections. And that is uh, my presentation. I wanna say briefly that I have some books on the back counter for after the service and Disrupted Realism is in the Cambria Library. But I look forward to hearing you know, from all of you about what you saw in today's paintings.